case you're not aware of us. We are a leading distributor of wireless infrastructure products. Uh, we have a superior supply chain solution, uh, extensive inventory, and uh, experts all across our uh, company in, in all different uh, areas of expertise, uh, from uh, wireless to point-to-point uh, -point radios to uh, DAS and uh, in buildings. We uh, provide tech support and training as well, and uh, our warehouses are located in the U.S., Canada, as well as uh, the Cala region. Just some of the solutions that uh, we're involved with. Uh, one side is on our infrastructure side, so on the macro uh, antenna side, the uh, macro tower. Um, fiber expertise, uh, we do uh, uh, a lot of fiber terminations for uh, fiber to the antenna and fiber to the radio. Uh, indoor and outdoor DAS solutions, as well as microwave backhaul. And uh, what's required for all of that is the supply chain to bring that together to make sure that uh, your builds are successful. Our focus is, is on uh, carriers, contractors, integrators, and OEMs. Uh, so we supply pretty much anybody that is doing wireless work in uh, North and uh, South America. Some of our wireless infrastructure solutions, uh, fiber and coax cable, uh, as well as connectorization, as I mentioned previously. Um, antennas, including indoor and uh, as well as base station antennas. Uh, accessories, anything you need to put on a, on a site as far as connectors, cable, uh, hangers, anything like that, as well as DAS solutions. So we have indoor and outdoor small cell solutions, uh, DAS cabling, antennas, um, as well as uh, passive and active products that uh, help uh, support uh, DAS installation. At Alliance, we are the experts in PIM, fiber, indoor DAS, outdoor DAS, as well as supply chain solutions. And uh, we have uh, run a quite an extensive uh, uh, seminar solution on, uh, on PIM, and this is just one of the many other ones that we are doing on that. Just a brief note uh, before I pass it off to Atesh. Uh, our next webinar is going to be on enclosures. Look forward to uh, uh, your email, and uh, we will be sending you uh, dates on that one. But at this time, I'm, I'm going to hand it off to uh, Hitesh and Fernando. And uh, thank you very much, guys. All right, thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. I um, want to uh, thank Alliance for putting this call together. Uh, we're we're excited to offer our opportunity to um, to offer our perspectives on on PIM and the the pain that it causes on some of these solutions uh, on these DAS deployments, specifically to um, to both low power and high power. But what we what the examples that we're going to talk about today are specific to the low power. Um, I'll be presenting, this is Hitesh, my name is Hitesh Chatria, I'm the Director of Sales Engineering at Solid. I'll be presenting um, the, the case studies that we've put together for, uh, for the projects that we've had some experiences in as far as, with, as far as PIM issues are concerned. And Fernando, he's, he's our uh, Sales Engineer for Solid based on the West Coast. He'll be presenting the technical overview of PIM and, um, and some some solutions and recommendations around around how to prevent some PIM issues on DAS deployments. Uh, just for those of you that don't know, Solid is a publicly traded uh, communications company. We're a product and solutions innovator, headquartered in Seoul, South Korea. Um, our U.S. headquarters is uh, is brand new. Uh, we just announced it a few weeks ago. It's based in Sunnyvale, California. It houses our logistics center demonstration uh, showcase area, uh, training classrooms, NOC, um, et cetera. And also, uh, you know, we warehouse all of our inventory here in the U.S. We're, um, we're ba our primary core focus is RF amplification and optical transport, which obviously bodes well for DAS solutions. Uh, we do cellular public safety, single carrier, multi-carrier, high power um, type solutions. We do optical network transport solutions, and small cell type uh, applications, neutral host Wi-Fi offload, um, Wi-Fi networks and stadiums. So we can get into all that on the optical side. And then uh, we're also focusing on some emerging, emerging technologies with passive optical LAN solutions to do uh, services like fiber to the room type services for 4K TV. 
So um, some interesting applications with our core technologies and focuses that we that we're able to to get into. Um, so why uh, so, you know, so essentially PIM PIM and Solid, and we've we've had experiences with PIM for years um, within within Solid, and the reason being is you know there's some deployments that we've been a part of in like Southeast Asia, for example, and it, we've primarily dealt with anywhere from the 20 watt output power all the way up to 80 watts. So, um, you know, it's all type DAS or fiber fiber fed repeater type solutions. So we've we've dealt with PIM uh, PIM issues on high power for for a long time, and Fernando will talk to that in a little bit more in detail. But um, but we've also now we're not we're now experiencing fiber, or we're now experiencing issues with PIM on low power as well. So, you know, we have have significant amount of DASH projects now now affected by PIM and with the new LTE bands and, and the data, the data throughput requirements, we're actually seeing these problems um, cause some significant, some significant uh, issues with the actual DASH deployment. Um, so in, in our opinion, at this point, PIM is definitely one of the top three problems faced on a, day, on a daily project um, aspect. So as an OEM, we really, we really see this on, a, on a, a daily basis at this point. We're seeing PIM issues come up in, in all different applications. So what we're going to focus on today is our low power DAS and our pain points in PIM how to identify it, how to solve for it, what causes it. Uh, and then we'll also talk about some lessons learned and best practices. And we'll talk about some recommendations uh, as, as we as an industry, as a DAS industry, should consider. So first, you know, I'm going to talk about a case study. So we're going to open up our, uh, our kimono a little bit here. But I think it's a story that will help the industry in general improve. So Last summer, we spent uh, we spent a considerable amount of time and resources on trying to solve a network problem at Nike World Headquarters, a DAS deployment that uh, that we worked with a uh, very well respected integrator on. Um, the the de the deployment itself went very well. Uh, we brought on the two first two major carriers and uh, operators, and um, and the system was performing great. And essentially, what what happened was we brought on um, we brought on an 800 megahertz band for for a uh, for a wireless operator, and Intermod showed up in the 850 megahertz uplink band for for both of the other uh, for both Verizon and AT&T. So essentially, what we did is we were troubleshooting everywhere from the donor antenna the the, the BDAs, the repeaters, uh, for both for both the 850 megahertz and the 800 megahertz, and we weren't able to narrow it down to anything specific in the head end. It just seemed like we were getting some outside interference. Um, and this was, you know, this was a, well, this happened over a year ago at this point, and so PIM wasn't top of mind at that point for for solid. Um, especially for a low power type application such as this, where it was less than one watt output power at the remote units. So we went through uh, we went through and we brought in a couple of industry experts on as far as troubleshooting is concerned to try to help help resolve this issue. Um, and some certain tools were used. We used uh, a two watt PIM tester, we used spectrum analyzers, uh, we used uh, PIM rated jumpers, PIM loads, and essentially we we performed PIM testing at the head end, um, from the head end, from the DAS head end to the output of the remote by essentially connecting up our PIM tester and putting a PIM a PIM load at the output of the remote. And at that point, we were able to see that there was no PIM associated, there's no issues associated with the actual active components of the DAS. So then we went down uh, and troubleshot further past that output of the remote. And we found that when testing the um, testing the RF jumpers at the output of the remote, we were able to see that there was 
there was an actual PIM issue with every single jumper deployed on that on that system. So um, we, of course, uh, and of course, everything was always uh, rushed and accelerated. And so we we actively went through and replaced every single jumper in the system, and that resolved about 90% of the problem. We dropped our noise floor dropped by about 20 dB at that point. Um, our noise rise dropped about 20 dB at that point, and we still had about we still had about five to six dB to go, and we saw that it was still the same type of issue. It was just significantly less. So then we went through and we troubleshot even further. We went we went and started troubleshooting um, further along the passive runs, and we found about eight antennas out of about 140 that weren't passing the PIM spec. Um, and once those antennas were replaced, the the system started performing as expected and as advertised. So you know it's just a uh, real world example where it's where we saw an immediate improvement in noise floor throughput performance once the PIM issues were resolved. Um, so, so it is so it is a real issue. It is a problem that this industry faces, even on low power solutions at less than one watt. So, um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Fernando. Fernando is going to go through the technical overview of PIM and what causes it, and all the details there. And then um, I'll wrap up with another with another case study. So, Fernando, go ahead. Thank you, Hitesh. Uh, Hitesh's example and case study uh, is a clear example of uh, the, the fine points and, and the areas where uh, if best practices are not pursued, then you open yourself up to the present pin. And I hope I can uh, elaborate on these details, but first I will commence with a slight theoretical perspective on the, the origin of PIM, where it comes from, uh, and a historical perspective and how PIM has become a beneficial aspect of the uh, uh, commissioning process of a communication system, be it from a macro layer and now, more importantly, uh, in the uh, DAS layer. I'm a sales engineer for SOLID, and uh, I have a background uh, where uh, PIM testing has been uh, uh, part of my uh, activity since the inception of modern PIM testing, if you will, for uh, 3G and 4G technologies. So the impact of PIM has transferred from what used to be originally thought of as a means of suppressing the presence of PIM as a noise uh, presence in the uplink or, if you will, the receive band. Uh, in this slide, what we hear uh, described is the, fundamentally this, the fundamental description of the presence of two high-powered components uh, in the transmit band. And uh, originally, in the macro layer, what we thought of signals coming out of a base station radio system where the output power levels are on the order of uh, 20 watts and higher. And um, PIM originally was discovered to be beneficial in that uh, when PIM was detected as an inner mod or spurious rise in a nonlinear environment where it's not in the same frequency as present with the two transmitting signals, but rather in a completely different sideband, in a receiver RX band, as described in the slide on the left hand side. Uh, what, what then translated to this was by suppressing PIM, you could actually extend the range of the cell site, thus uh, contributing to the benefit of uh, extending cell installations on a macro level to the point where you could uh, reduce your construction costs because you have virtually much longer or further coverage from the macro system. Uh, as new technologies have evolved where more data intensive applications have arisen, uh, 
the dynamics of the PIM, its effects have gone beyond uh, uh, the aspect of just controlling the noise to extend the range of the cell site. And with data intensive applications, that has now become a much more um, severe impact to the throughput of the system. So fundamentally, we're describing a process in which with a minimal interaction of two frequency high powered tones, uh, you will have the presence of an arc uh, and intermod rise nonlinearly in a received band. Mathematically, it can be described as a third order intermod and to a lesser degree a fifth and furthermore a seventh uh, degree intermod. The most severe impacts typically tend to be on the third order intermod, but the other ones can also arise. Now, imagine a scenario where you have more than two fundamental tones if you have several tones, as is the case with a more realistic scenario, then the increase in the amount of intermod tones will also increase considerably. Hence, that is where we describe the rise in the noise levels, as will be described uh, later in the next few slides. Next slide, please. Fernando, it's Lisa here. I just want to ask if you can speak a little bit louder. It's a little bit. Sure, by all means. Uh, Thank you. Hope this is a little better. Someone was asking. Okay. So uh, here we have a description of the presence of two high-powered high tones at a 20-watt level. Uh, the reason we're talking 20 watts basically is it was established. Uh, in the IEC standards, that 20 watts is a given uh, reasonable standard power level from which we can then derive the acceptable intermod levels that uh, can be characterized as uh, nominally suppressed, if you will. And it was standardized in the early 2000s, and the 143 or 140 dBc level is the uh, accepted uh, threshold of where PIM levels should be controlled to. Uh, there are two ways of expressing this PIM presence. It's in, it's in a PBC uh, fashion, if you will, where that is translated as decibels below the carrier. So if you take a 43 dBm uh, carrier level and you drop that signal minus 140 dBs from it, you will be at a level equivalent to Neg 97 dBm. And so that is about the level where the noise is going to be given you achieve a 140 or negative 140 dBc level on the PIM. More uh, recently, it has been thought of that uh, radio signals coming out of the base stations uh, are, are pushing uh, much higher levels than 43 dBm. Hence, the specification uh, of minus 140 dBc is now being challenged and considered to be insufficient to be able to handle that of higher carrier signals. In other words, the higher the carrier signal, the higher the pain is going to be as an effect. And the same, by the same token, if you go on the opposite side where you lower the carrier tone, hence the intermod level is going to be affected. And that factor tends to be 2 to 3 dB per carrier power, of which we will explain in more detail in a later slide. As this now puts the focus on ensuring that the elements of the passive uh, portions of the system, by way of say the cabling and the components associated to it, including the antenna, are going to be challenged to be even better for PIM than what currently exists. Next slide, please. So in order to properly uh, apply characterization of PIM and to also anticipate uh, the contribution of PIM by the various components in a communication system, uh, one of the standard practices that has been established with the inception of the prominence of PIM as a significant value in the, in the characterization of a communication system was the pretesting of the components. In particular, the antenna. The antenna pretesting is is essential in that if 
you properly characterize the PIM response of an antenna by itself directly connected to it by way of a test port jumper that is from the uh, PIM analyzer, you will avoid uh, and take that element out of the system PIM equation in that in a DAS system, uh, system PIM characterization is one of the more challenging areas of, of conducting such a test. And the reason for that is that uh, you are typically uh, uh, involved in an environment where the antenna is uh, and the radiating signal coming out of the antenna is exposed to a variety of reflections coming back from the facility or the building, uh, some if not significant portion of which may be a pin source. Uh, so to eliminate the antenna as being a variable in that uh, system pin uh, degradation should be detected, it would be wise to pretest that antenna. Uh, that was one of the standard first standard practices that was implemented in the modern pin testing uh, uh, arena in the late 2000s, and that immediately discovered a rather high failure rate of PIM to the antenna. And that was associated to manufacturing deficiencies, uh, be it that the manufacturers were not fully aware of how they needed to uh, conform to the way a antenna should be manufactured to mitigate the PIM effects. And these areas were ranging from soldering cracks in the antenna's uh, circuitry uh, loose connectors, rivets, uh, cracks or uh, damages to, say, the ray dome or the cover to the antenna, and, and even debris and, and debris associated to the connector itself. Uh, failure rates on the order of 25% were present, and, and uh, that was an intolerable uh, degree of failure to, to be well accepted when you're considering a vast, large, say, LTE type of deployment. Uh, those practices by the manufacturers were well observed. And another aspect was their process of testing their antennas in a clean room environment as opposed to in a realistic ambient environment where pre-testing of the antennas, uh, in our opinion, should be conducted in a real world ambient environment where there are signals around in the environment. Hence, sometimes signals tend to interact with the signal of a pin transmitter. And you have to quantify that. And by pre-testing it, you are able to get a much better perspective on how that antenna is going to be performing. So that is one of the more significant stages of making sure that you avoid uh, uh, PIM-related problems by characterizing the antenna. Going forward, it's also wise to apply such practices to the passive elements of the system, uh, in particular, is the components. Uh, and that is also related to if you have ample or available time to characterize pretty much every component in a respective DAS system. And in the large type of applications, that may be a bit of a challenge because you've got quite a lot of uh, components to address. Uh, a practice to, to apply to this is more or less on a yield basis to where if you have the uh, comfort level where you establish some minute degree of statistical analysis where your failure rates are, are getting to the point where they're very well controlled and, and anticipated, uh, pre-testing initially in a project uh, would benefit in that you have a much better uh, perspective on how these components are behaving. And it's also beneficial in that by pre-testing such a component, when it's deployed out in the actual facility and you're introducing other aspects of the installation process, you have a better means of being able to quantify what is it that is causing that failure. Because it's also, despite testing these components on a direct pre-testing level, it will also give you a perspective on if you experience failures when these components are uh, connected to one another and you experience failures at that level, 
then you have a much better idea as to whether it's associated to the installation process as opposed to the manufacturing process. This is also the transport process, which is more in, in, in uh, association to see an antenna, but it's the manufacturing process versus the installation process that you will be able to then quantify. And all the while, well, this is really important in that the utilization of a low PIM load, and for that matter, loads, I mean plural, more than one load, are very important in that the PIM load is the essential part of your PIM test analyzer, uh, not for calibration's sake, because there's no error correction being done, but it is more of a uh, verification and a sanity check that your analyzer is performing uh, well connected to the respective test port cable that allows you to connect to the various ports and such that you will interact with. So practice of verifying that you have a good low pin load and loads for that matter, because sometimes you've been dealing with components with multi-ports and such, and your test port cable is performing very well, and they are all very clean and repeatedly clean, as I will elaborate further, will give you a leg up on being able to establish a good system pin performance further down the road. Go ahead, uh, next slide, please. So uh, the pin test process, from our perspective in a DAS system, can be broken down into three stages. Uh, the first stage, uh, what we described here on the slide is section A, is perhaps the most critical of the stages, and that is because that is the portion where the cabling interacting or interfacing between the base station and the uh, DAS tray, or the conditioner, if you will, uh, is exposed to significant and high power levels. And that is the area where, as originally described, the presence of high power tones on a uh, uh, element, a component, in this case a cable, uh, can create significant levels of tension. Uh, and this is also the stage where it's not just sufficient to be able to characterize PIM on a, uh, on a one type of uh, one type of shot, one one test, if you will, one signal, one stage, or one variable, but apply a dynamic test to the process where you are actually physically shifting changing, tapping the cable and or the connectors with a uh, uh, soft type of tool, not a, not a hammer, if you will, but applying some sort of a dynamic process where shaking the cable will uh, give you a much better uh, understanding as to the stability of the pin performance of that cable and, for that matter, the connectors. There are some techniques where, literally, where if you are tapping the connector, uh, terminated to a load, pin load, obviously, and you are experiencing uh, uh, nominal uh, pin thresholds close to on the order of one hundred and forty dBc, sometimes tapping a connector will literally move some debris within the back body of the connector that will actually cause pin to be mitigated in and of itself. That's not to say that the practice of cleaning a connector both inside and out should not be followed. That is of the utmost importance. But yeah, as you get more and more experience with that process, you tend to discover that kind of an effect. And of course, continuous tapping, not to an extent of, of several seconds, but a, quite a few seconds, 10 to 15 seconds, and, and turning the cable in a circular fashion will uh, certainly give you a much better understanding and confidence level that the pin performance of that cable is within standards. Then comes the interaction of the uh, DAS tray conditioner, or uh, what SOLID has uh, recently introduced, uh, as we call it a link balancer. This is the interface in which is taking the high-powered level signals from a base station and lowering it down to a power range that a base station interface will be uh, handling. Uh, there's also duplexing and biplexing taking place and such, and the instrument 
or the units have to have uh, variable attenuators. So the components within the, this, this unit uh, need to be of a low PIM quality, low PIM rated quality. Uh, and you tend to have a misnomer there. The lower the PIM, the more suppressed the PIM is. Some people would actually convey this as a, a high quality PIM. But in effect, the lower the PIM, you know, the low PIM type of component is the most beneficial of them all. And Solid has partnered with uh, one of the leading experts uh, of uh, PIM and uh, an innovator in the actual development of PIM analyzers to apply it to what I described previously as, as uh, literally range extenders to a macro site to what is now, you know, modern day PIM equipment that can uh, be utilized in various fashions, various frequency bands, and also uh, with derivatives of the utilization of uh, PIM as a function of uh, time, so a sweeping in time and sweeping in power levels. But uh, the wireless operators tend to keep it simple and wanting to characterize PIM at a certain set of frequencies associated to the transmit and the seed bands that they operate in, uh, but not necessarily in the operational bands, but in guard bands, if you will. Uh, and conceptually, it was well accepted that prior to the advent of ultra-wideband antennas, that the utilization of, say, 850 megahertz uh, PIM analyzers would sufficient to handle the characterization of 700 meg uh, components, provided, of course, that the components can handle that bandwidth. And separately, a uh, separate PIM analyzer would be required to cover, say, your 1900, 1800, or uh, also the ultra-higher frequencies in the 2000 plus uh, megahertz range. So uh, Kalis has had a tremendous amount of experience and has grown with expertise, and we feel it's advantageous to develop such a solution in partnership with them. And uh, the solid uh, late balancer units have a very good low PIM quality uh, components within to allow that signal to be conditioned and, and be on the range uh, of the power levels of the base station interface system, which is now translating the the scenario to the stage B, where now you're talking power levels that are uh, much lower than than the uh, 20 watt plus levels. And, uh, by the same token, that radio signal, which in our scenario gets converted to light and eventually gets uh, converted back to RF, now translates to a stage C scenario. In C scenario, you're going to have uh, a couple of, of different approaches in which the traditional one watt uh, remote output units uh, will now create a scenario where it begs the question as to is PIM uh, going to affect uh, the performance of a DAS system at a significantly lower power level at one watt compared to what is obviously the case at 20 watts? Uh, and the answer is yes. It does, and we will describe uh, further in terms of how it does. And we actually have case studies and slides showing representing you know the impact of a PIM even at a one watt level. Solid does provide uh, high power remotes, such as the Titan. These are utilized in venues and facilities where you have a quasi hybridization of a DAS system, say in a in a uh, stadium environment or a racetrack environment where the high power remote now is utilized to cover areas such as the parking area uh, of the facility and such. In, uh, in any scenario, you're going to have a high powered remote such as a Titan and other such remotes, even on the order of five blocks and such, you're going to have uh, the potential of PIM and those absolutely have to be characterized to the extent of, of full characterization, be it from a pre-testing level all the way up to the actual deployment level. So let's describe these a little further. Next slide, please. So in a uh, deployment, such as in a tunnel system, you are going to experience PIMs in more ways than one. Uh, 
uh, in a large deployment such as a tunnel type of system. The, there is a mixture of, of both a uh, uh, low power type of remote as well as a high power remote. Hence, the presence of both then raises the, the, the knowledge that practice of techniques of both types of, uh, of test characterizations is, is evident. Uh, the cabling between the remote and the antenna uh, has to be, in a certain sense, pristine. And now the environment of characterizing these cables really raises the awareness and the practice levels to virtually a CSI level, where everything has to be meticulously clean. And that is perhaps one of the most significant portions of of controlling and mitigating PIMP is by being able to enhance your PIMP test process by utilizing techniques that are with the aspect of applying cleansing techniques to the connectors, your test port cable, and your PIMP loads. Let's elaborate a little further on this. Next slide, please. Bear with me here. A little function going on with my deck. Okay, so under optimum conditions, uh, a low power pin scenario is very difficult to detect. Um, however, there is a major pin source. Uh, present in the uplink band if there is a significant failure with the PIM. In other words, if you apply a go-no-go -no -go type of uh, approach to low power PIM testing, you will have uh, beneficial results in catching those PIM sources where you need to prior to the, the introduction of that PIM into the DAS environment when it's turned on. Um, the real essence of this scenario is the understanding that the translation from a carrier power level of 20 watts down to, say, 1 watts uh, on the intermod or uplink intermod PIM noise is 2 to 3 dB per carrier level. So if you convert a 43 dBm carrier power to 30 dBm, the equivalent of 1 watt, your intermod level will literally drop 159.5 dBCs or about neg 129.5 dBm. Now, pretty much everyone would be uh, in accordance that that level of PIM is negligible, well below the noise of the typical receiver, hence it's not a problem. Where the problem comes is if you introduce high PIM sources from poor quality components, cabling, and such. And now you've gotten a rise in the PIM level. And let's create a scenario where you have a PIM source that is literally on the order of NEG 89, uh, or NEG 19, 119 and a half DBCs from that one watt carrier tone. That translates to NEG 89 and a half DBM. So that major PIM source now becomes a significant problem to, say, a DAS system. And that is what we are trying to convey and what we have experienced in that. Typically, most such elements, the components that have relatively reasonable and pretty good performance on a low power uh, PIM test, when they fail, they fail hard and it will hit your system very hard. Hence, we convey the, the application of techniques and processes that are in accordance with similar practices at a high power level uh, should be followed in that it saves yourself quite a lot of headaches. And most importantly, it enhances the performance of the system. In today's uh, 4G LTE environment, the, the whole network is being challenged to get the most capacity, the best signal quality, the best uh, uh, 
error vector magnitude, this is a parameter described, say, in the LTE domain. And there are other such parameters, EC over I naught and such. Well, these digital quality parameters and metrics um, are being monitored and being reviewed. And the presence of PIM has been known to cause uh, these metrics to be compromised. And the operators, the wireless operators, uh, are wanting to achieve not just the levels of what we currently has been observed to be 20, 30 megabytes per second, but even much faster than that, because the LTE, by theory, is able to handle a significantly faster de degree of, of throughput performance. It has been known that the presence of PIN in a communications environment, be it a macro or a DAS, will compromise the system in its ability to maintain the high quality of those digital parameters. So when noise is introduced in the uplink band or the receive band, hence the system in the network will equalize itself. And by equalizing itself, it will, in order to maintain the quality, slow the system down. And by slowing the system down, you now compromise the throughput. Therefore, you compromise the whole benefit of what LTE is bringing to the table. It is data intensive type of, of system that allows you to offer much faster throughput rates for all those uh, pulsal networks and what is coming down the road, even higher degree video resolution applications and such. Let's go to the next slide, please. So uh, describing where PIM sources can be found, uh, we have uh, here a slide describing the basic sources of PIM, not necessarily in an order of uh, priority, uh, oxidation is certainly a, a major impact to PIN in that corrosion uh, and water ingress within a cabling system is a major effect, just as much as it would be in a, a sweep test scenario where you have a high degree of return loss. Well, oxidation will cause PIN sources. And in fact, oxidations in areas beyond the antenna, uh, say due to rusted transformers, rusted condensers, uh, uh, rusty nails and bolts that the signal will hit, bounce back into the system, are going to be pin sources. So mitigation of oxidation and suppression of oxidation or avoidance of it at all in a uh, scenario beyond the antenna are, are certainly encouraged. Poor plating uh, of components such as your uh, directional couplers, splitters, and such. Um, the type of plating that comes with, say, inexpensive, low-cost components made of tin, if you will. Tin to nick and scratch quite easily. And in a scenario where you're in a hurry to install a system and put this thing as quickly as you can, will introduce nicks and scratches that become uh, junction gaps and uh, analogous to, say, a capacitor in which you're going to have a, an arc present there when a pin is created. Hence, uh, the selection of high quality components that are preferably on the order of silver plated components. Uh, there's a, quite a, a, a lot of deployments utilizing tri plated. And those, in our experience, have tended to be somewhat compromised in that they're still susceptible to nicks and scratches. Uh, so the higher the degree of quality of the component will relieve a lot of headaches and, and, and concerns when considering the presence of pain in a communication system. Uh, junction gaps, again, act like a capacitor. They can be, as I described, in a, in a nick or a scratch, but furthermore, when connectors are not properly torqued. So connecting connectors properly to an interface are of the best practice utilizing torqued, calibrated torque wrenches respective to the diameter of the connector. This brings on the, the actual uh, point that the most preferred digital communications connector interface is the 7 16th diameter connector. That connector of its larger diameter has a much a larger surface area contact and therefore uh, allows for not just better electrical conductivity, but a better uh, contact surface to tighten with and therefore have a better, much better performance to a higher performance DAS and or wireless communication systems 
be it in a macro or for that matter a uh, DAS layer. And we have followed that in our link balancer unit with the utilization of DIN connectors on our high power test port interfaces and then our uplink band interfaces, uh, mini DIN connectors as opposed to the, and the theoretical uh, PIM intermod of these connectors of a much lower degree than say type N, although N tends to uh, uh, apply applicably as well, but you just have to follow much more stricter practices with the utilization of N and making sure that if you do use it in, as is the case always with a DIN connector, you have a flat type of interface that you can torque with. You need to torque it. Debris is the most significant aspect of the contribution of PIM. Uh, you have to swipe with isopropyl alcohol or a spray that has a majority isopropyl. And isopropyl is being referred to as minimizing, if at all eliminating, the presence of water in, in the liquid that you're spraying this with. A spray is preferable than, than a dip of a swab. Why? Because with a spray, you can loosen any debris or residue that is with, within the components and connectors and such of the system. Uh, and as you use your test port cable and your low pin load, those portions of the system should also be continuously cleaned so that you don't have uh, uh, debris associated to the cabling that you're connecting to translate back to your test ports, which then enhances the possibility of pen further. Next slide, please. So braided cable, as uh, Hitesh had previously mentioned or referred to, is probably the first largest, biggest uh, no-no in, in, in that this is very prone to junction gaps and in a dynamic testing will certainly create a high degree of pain both in a high power scenario as it will in a low power scenario. Um, solid outer conductor cabling, preferably of the corrugated fashion with a thicker wall are beneficial in that those tend to offer a much better contact of the back body of the connector to the front body so it can be tightened better and therefore torqued better to the interface of the next cabling. We've experienced the utilization of uh, thinner walled outer conductors, and for that matter, aluminum, uh, tend to become a problem in that the flaring of the aluminum outer conductor tends to wrinkle uh, when applied to a connector, and that wrinkle will introduce itself as junction gaps into the uh, connection. Connectorizing and even hard, uh, solid, corrugated outer conductor type of cabling should also be uh, made aware that over-torquing a connector to a cable can also introduce pin in that it will narrow that outer conductor to the point where you introduce junction gaps. Next slide, please. So in essence, uh, the practice of cleanliness, as well as guardliness, if you will, is, is very essential in the proper pin test process uh, of a BAS system to make sure you mitigate the introduction of debris into the pin testing scenario. We uh, feel that despite a low power scenario where the inner mod is significantly lower than in a high power scenario, if you have a high degree of failure, it will cause a severe headaches and compromises the performance of the system. Utilization of tools like low pin loads, good test board cables, uh, proper torque wrenches, uh, isopropyl alcohol, or sprays that do not have water, um, but also don't have the type of chemicals that will, say, uh, evaporate or affect the foam within a cable. Well, you have to be aware of there that, that you have a proper spray that you're utilizing and swabs. And cleaning everything from the get-go will give you a much better PIM performance out of your system so that you can benefit from the PIM performance of the DAS. And that concludes my portion. I'm going to transfer this back to Hitesh so we can give you some case studies. All right. Thank you, Fernando. I appreciate it. Um, so actually, with, with respect to time here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over uh, the last case study. Um, but essentially, the uh, well, I'll talk about it briefly here. 
essentially the highlight of it was we have a, a project that has both 700 public safety and 700 LTE deployed on it. And the 700 public safety downlink was actually causing a significant amount of noise in the LTE upper C-band on the uplink. Um, and you know, we went through an extensive troubleshooting process, uh, verified and, and, and actually improved the filtering and the active DAS perform and performance of that without without really having any without really seeing a significant benefit. Um, end result to make, to make a long story short here, end result was we were able to see a significant noise improvement by following a lot of the practices that Fernando just laid out. Um, we were able to uh, we were able to narrow it down to a certain type of antenna that was causing the issue. And once that antenna was replaced, we noticed a, um, as you can see here, we noticed a significant noise uh, throughput increase um, overall. So we were actually, we were actually uplink, uh, the, the uplink was disabled of the system due to PIM. There was no, there was no throughput on uplink for LTE. Once the PIM issues were resolved, the throughput was as expected uh, for a for a MIMO type solution. So, um, so based on that, uh, some lessons learned and some recommendations that we want to go through. So standards uh, standards need to be set by the wireless operators for PIM testing, in our opinion, in order to prevent a lot of these issues in the back end. Um, certifications by uh, for the DAS installations, for the engineers that are performing the installations, um, we believe that that would that would mitigate a lot of these problems on the, on the back end as well. Just awareness of of the issues and of the problems that can occur. Um, so you know, PIM is a PIM is a problem that is that impacts everybody. It impacts the integrator, it impacts the wireless operator, um, it impacts the end customer, and it impacts the OEM of the of the active DAS equipment, our name is on the box. <laughs> so, uh, so some you know, so industry education and training, we believe, is is very val valuable for everybody. Um, so, with uh, with that, I'll hand it back to Mike and Lisa, and thank you for the opportunity for allowing us to present. Well, thank you guys. Uh, that was uh, very informative. Great stuff. Um, Let's. Uh, anybody who has questions, please uh, put it into the chat window, and we will uh, we will definitely uh, get to as many as we can. And if any questions we don't get to, we will be responding uh, via email to you and uh, letting you know uh, our response to it. So, uh, Lisa, if you want to start with uh, some of the questions, we actually haven't received any. Uh, although I, I am going to read out some of the ones that we received on registration. Okay. So, if anybody has a question, please uh, feel free to type it in your chat window. Uh, okay, so there was one question that says, yes, I'd like to know how much power is necessary to create PIM. So I guess, did you hear me okay? Yeah, Fernando, can you take that one? Yes, I can take that. I was on mute, uh, apologize. But uh, the answer to that question is PIM will be present pretty much in any power scenario. What you have to quantify is to what degree of power scenario that will create a pin source is tolerable. Obviously, in the high power scenario, it is very intolerable to a degree of 140 dBc or 140 decibels below the carrier, equivalent of 97 dBm. If your RFSI or receiver thresholds tend to be much lower than that, Hence, the, the need to enhance or increase that threshold is certainly the case. In a low power scenario where you're going to be on the order of make 129 and a half Yeah. then you're starting to consider what is acceptable, and you will encounter that if you don't follow best practices or choose good selected components, you will introduce the high pin source scenario, and that is where it's going to be intolerable. Well, the answer to the question, yes, it is present all the time. It's just a matter of the lower the power, the translation is 2 to 3 dBs per 
carrier power. So a 10 dB change would be 20 to 30 dB drop in the inner mod level. By then, he may be well within the noise, so it's not a problem. But it's still there, theoretically, mathematically. Okay, we've got a couple of questions that people have submitted who are on, online. Um, are there any identified cable jumper products to allow the solid outer shield and maximum flexibility? Um, so I could maybe take that, uh, and, and Fernando, maybe you can follow up if you have anything to, to add to it. Um, the, the challenge between flexibility and low PIM is, is, is tough. There are products out there. Um, they tend to get a little more expensive than what everybody's used to uh, using. Um, and, uh, you know, it gives you the flexibility, but uh, it, it keeps the PIM in line. The problem with uh, braided connectors, uh, obviously, as mentioned, uh, which give you great flexibility, is they're, they're terrible for, for PIM. So um, there are options. We are working actively with many, many manufacturers trying to find a solution that, uh, you know, gives you the holy grail, low cost as well as low PIM. Um, but, uh, you know, if anybody wants to contact me directly, I can uh, definitely uh, give them some more information on that. Okay, so there's another question. With so many DAS equipment manufacturers out there, is, an in, is there an industry standard certif certification or education program that is vendor agnostic? Hey, you want to take that? <laughs> um, I know there are, there are a couple of uh, type, uh, industry, I guess, uh, equipment agnostic type uh, training seminars, but um, but I, I, mean, I could provide some names offline. So I, I, I could actually jump in. Kalis is actually working on one. Um, we have we have done one at this point for DAS specific training. Um, so you can uh, definitely contact us or uh, or Saul, and we can put you uh, to the right people at Kalis for those type of training sessions. Okay, here's a question specifically about solid equipment. Um, what, if any, filtering is present within the solid equipment to allow isolation of multi-band deployments? Well, that's, uh, that's actually one of our key benefits um, at solid is that we, we actually have saw filtering built into the equipment, uh, sur surface acoustic wave filtering in the amplifier modules as well as in the head end. Um, and essentially what that does is it's a, it's a wideband filter that filters the uplink and the downlink. Um, creates that isolation required for multi-band applications. Uh, the application I discussed, I mentioned earlier briefly, McCarran Airport, that system has 700 public safety, 700 LTE, 800 public safety, um, and plus the four major wireless operators in, uh, in the U.S. all on that, all on that one, one uh, system on that same, same strand of fiber. Uh, so we we also in addition to the soft filtering we have we have cavity filtering built into the remote as well to mitigate um, as much as much interference as we can. However, PIM is uh, filtering doesn't really it doesn't necessarily fix PIM issues because it is in band interference. So. Okay, here's a question that we had uh, on registration: um, the rusty bolt effect. PIM mitigation when every antenna is surrounded by building seal slash possible PIM sources outside the cable. Um, well, I, I think the question is going to external sources of PIM, and uh, I believe that it was what it is. And, and it's obviously it's a it's a challenge that everybody's going to face, um, and it, it has more to do with antenna placements um, and you know where it goes inside the building. So the, the placement versus expected coverage versus your IV wave, uh, you know, uh, diagrams uh, becomes a challenge there. But uh, previously we've seen where antennas are hooked up onto a, you know, a plastic uh, uh, handle where they can actually move the antenna around to find that exact place where you're not going to have the PIM and you're going to get that expected uh, coverage levels. Um, so what, that's one technique that you can uh, work on on the in-building side of things. You guys have anything to add it, on that? It, yes, if I could uh, elaborate on that a little further, it's, it's exactly the case in that, that that is a novel approach that I saw in a previous seminar uh, conducted by Kalis in which the utilization of a handle 
to an antenna that allows you to place that antenna in locations where with a portable skin analyzer you can conduct a system skin space almost directly to the antenna um, and pick and choose where you may have the minimal amount of TIM. There are some dynamics taking place that are of interest here. It has been known that TIM is not just an amplitude but a vector. Hence, it has a phase associated to it, and the application of that type of process it will allow you to find a sweet spot. And this can be applied in the CW test process, where as you're trying to find the best antenna placement where you get the best signal coverage, where you can also use that same process to get the minimal amount of pin. Because you may find a sweet spot where the vectors pretty much cancel or try to cancel each other. And you get the lowest amount of things contributed to that by that antenna. Okay, uh, here's another one that's sort of related. Uh, how PIM affects high-speed data, and if RSSI levels are good and PIM test is bad, is there still an issue? From my perspective, uh, PIM definitely affects throughput level. Uh, as I described earlier, in that the networks attempt to maintain the, the high quality of the signal will tend to slow itself down, so it is in conformance of maintaining the high quality levels of the signal, be it the digital metrics. And so throughput has been known to be compromised with the presence of PIM because that affects the quality it degrades the quality. So that effect is certainly uh, evident. Um, with respect to RSSI and the presence of PIM, uh, it's a matter of frequency uh, type of selection and the bandwidth of the detection being applied to measure RSSI. If that detection, which would tend to be narrower detection, wouldn't be in the same uh, frequency range of where the presence of PIM is, Hence, you may find a scenario where you have low RSSI, yet high PIM. And sometimes RSSI, as experience has shown us, it could be attributed to the presence of heat within the amplifier of a remote head, uh, and not a remote fast head, but actually a remote base station head, like an RAH or RLU, if you will. And hence, that contributes to our high RSSI because the amplifiers are running hot, and if you utilize the Boltzmann's constant, where KT, D, and T is part of that equation, your RSSI will be high, and you literally have had no PIM at all. We've seen that in macro layers where the antennas can be pointed straight up in the sky, and there's no PIM contributed by the, the communication system, being the cable component the antennas, yet the RSSI is there because the RRH is contributing to it. Okay, I have a couple more questions. Um, one, I think, is kind of uh, maybe something we can take offline, but it says discuss DIN, mini DIN connectors. Yep. Yes. Uh, so it, it, we, we're, we're, we're currently working with different uh, uh, vendors to pro provide solutions on mini DIN as, uh, beyond KLS. Um, they're a good solution compared to N, which was not designed for PIN. Um, and uh, yeah, we can we can take it further offline if you want to grab that person's uh, information. And then there was someone else who asked had a comment um, because I asked a question: uh, What are some of the issues you've come across when testing for PIM in a DAF network? And someone had commented: Antenna near field issues and crossband isolation. Sorry, isolation upon combining. I don't know if it's something you want to comment upon or just leave. Fernando? Well, the, the presence, the presence of, of, if you don't have enough crossband isolation, there is the possibility that PIM is going to be present. And in fact, uh, a major wireless operator uh, back in the day, which is relatively recent, in fact, but uh, let's call it upon the inception of the LTE deployment in North America, uh, discovered that core crossband isolation within the base station receiver introduce PIM coming from their amplifiers, just in the base station scenario alone. So that is certainly feasible and possible. 
our opinion beyond that, say, in a DAS environment is that it's, it's really pertinent to the power level and that if you take away uh, components such as cross-band bypass or duplexer from the equation and you have lower power levels, hence PIM sources won't be prevalent. But by doing that, then you compromise on wideband performance and flexibility and scalability of the system. Uh, the best scenario of both is to follow best PIM practices together with the best novelty of scalability and flexibility to achieve better performance overall. I think that's probably a good place to, uh, to end things. It's a good comment. Um, on, on behalf of Alliance, I'd like to thank you both to Tesh and uh, Fernando for doing a great job today. Mike, do you want to uh, close things out? Yep. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining. And, and again, Hitesh and uh, Fernando, awesome job. Really appreciate it. Um, anybody have any further comments, please, uh, please forward on to myself, and I can help you out with that. Um, and again, our next uh, webinar on enclosures will be coming up soon, and uh, we, uh, as with specific focus on on DAS uh, enclosures. Uh, so uh, please look look for that in your email inbox. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, and one more one more thing before I close out the webinar, I will be sending a copy of the PowerPoint um, in in PDF to everybody, and this has been recorded. So if you want to watch it later or you want to you know forward it to